everyone. I'm Yvonne Lawley. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Manitoba. Uh, I teach agronomy and cropping systems. Um, and so I do a lot of work with uh, new crops in Manitoba. You may have heard of them, soybeans and corn. I think you guys grow a lot of corn here. Um, so I have some experience with those crops. Um, but before I, before I became a corn grower, a soybean grower, uh, the area that I was most interested in and done most research on was cover crops. And so uh, when I started at the University of Manitoba in 2011, it was hard to get funding to do cover crops and I'm super excited that that climate has been changing. And so um, I'm here today to talk about the study uh, that's behind us here um, that we started last year in 2018 at Farming Smarter with a network of sites across the prairies. And I've also asked Ken to find a farmer that grows cover crops in the area. So Justin Dubin is here with me. So he's going to keep me honest and keep me relevant uh, for, for your region because I realize that I'm a transplant, but I'm sensitive to that. Even though, you know, as professors, we'd like to think that we know everything. So what I want to talk about today is the context for cover crops and how it's changed, how it's changing. Um, about this study and what we're hoping to learn over the next four years. And then just, you know, give you some take home uh, for those of you that are either doing cover crops, thinking about cover crops, just wondering where to get information about cover crops. Um, a few things that you can uh, take away. Uh, so, um, you know, this time of year, we're often thinking about crop inputs and you know, the crop inputs that we've used so far, have we, have we used them well, are they paying off, or we're about to go into a season, right, where we're thinking about spring and fungicide use, what are we getting out of those cover crops? And one thing I'd like you to think about today is using plants as a management tool for soil. So they can be a crop input. Often we think about managing soils in, uh, in the fall and in the spring, right, tillage. And so I'd like to challenge you to think about plant roots themselves or the, or the residue that we grow with plants as, a, as something that you can use a tool in your toolbox for managing soils so rather, than, rather than iron. Um, the context for talking about cover crops has also changed. I mean, there's a mixture of people of different ages here. Um, you know, probably the last time we were talking about cover crops on a big way across the prairies was when fallow was a really important part of the rotation on the prairies. You know, I was a little, I was knee high to a grasshopper at that time. But what I've, I've, I've heard from a lot of people and I've read a lot of papers about this concept of green fallow. So at the time, you know, we had a lot of fallow in the rotation. We, we knew we needed to reduce fallow but we needed to sto store moisture. So we were talking about using cover crops to cover the soil, keep it in place, probably feed mycorrhizae, um, but not use too much water because we didn't have the equipment to be able to do things like no-till. So that was really the last time I think that we've had sort of a prairie-wide conversation about cover crops. In the meantime, I mean, uh, people here in the Lethbridge area have really benefited to some from some uh, from the scientists that have been working with cover crops in the interim period, but I feel like we're at a we're in a new time with a new paradigm uh, for thinking about cover crops, and I think the interest is there across the prairies. Now we're certainly seeing this across the U.S. Midwest, and the challenge for us now, as both farmers and scientists, are to figure out how to how to make cover crops work and relevant. Um, in our in our local areas, um, in our cropping systems. So, is it our biggest issue time and fold? Okay, so I have done cover crop research in three different provinces or states, and that is definitely the thing that I hear. No matter where you are, people say I I do not have time. I do not have the growing season. Uh, to, and I do not have enough water to make that work. And you guys really might not have enough water here, but uh, <laughs> but you still have season and you still have time. Um, because, you know, everywhere you're farming, right, you farm to fill the season that you have, right? So no matter where you are, everyone is grow maxing out that growing season that they have. Um, uh, so I wanted to say... 
the window. So uh, when we were talking about green fallow last on the prairies, we were talking about intensifying our rotations to eliminate fallow. And we're still talking about our new paradigm of cover crops is still trying to fill uh, our growing season. But the fallow that we're thinking about replacing now isn't the whole, the full season fallow. It's those shoulder seasons, right? Because we are, for the most part, continuous, continuous cropping, unless there are some problems either with excess or deficient moisture. And so it's really, how do we get the most out of those shoulder seasons? Or when we have crops in the rotation that aren't growing for the full season, to try and use plants as our management tool for those soils in, in those situations. Okay, so what do we want plants to do during those shoulder seasons? Uh, I've brought along a few demonstrations here. So plants in our rotation, plants are our solar collectors. So we want plants to, we want to capture solar energy for a larger, for the, a larger period of time, right? We use our grain crops to capture solar energy and turn it into to grain that we can, that we can consume or feed to other things as energy. We know that there are microbes in the soil and we want to provide them with energy. We, may, we want to provide them with extra energy and we can do that during those shoulder seasons. So we want, we want to provide food for our microbes. Another thing that we want to do is, is build our soils and we want to um, provide organic matter that can also feed those microbes but also hold on to water, right? And so we can use those shoulder periods to try and stuff in um, more roots into the soil so that they can capture water and help us um, retain that water as well. Uh, and so we need to build some physical structures in the soil. We'll look at that in a few minutes from these roots over here. Okay. So those are some ideas, some, some concepts, I call it, you know, this new paradigm or way of thinking. Um, this experiment that you see here comes from some questions that we've been talking about. You know, do we have enough time? Can we make cover crops work on the prairies? And so in 2018, we started a project that's funded by Western Grains Research Foundation, Manitoba Pulse Growers, and Manitoba Wheat and Barley Growers. They all banded together. Um, and uh, even when, when others wouldn't fund it, uh, thankfully those farm organizations were willing to put some money into this research because, you know, we want to have answers. We start this experiment now, um, but we want to have answers for what we're going to need to know in the next five years. So I'm hoping that this uh, experiment, you know, if we're lucky, we'll, we'll continue beyond that period. And, uh, and it'll be a place where we can really learn a lot across the prairies about, about systems that involve extended cover. So uh, we're working with a team of scientists, so a team of sites. We've got Farming Smarter here, hosting a site in Lethbridge. We've got Lana Shaw at Redverse, Saskatchewan, uh, Steve Shirtliff and Kate Congreves hosting a site at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, and myself, I'm hosting a site in Carmen, Manitoba, so in central Manitoba, and just this year I'm adding a second site on a, on a heavy clay soil uh, uh, in Glenlee. So we've got this network of sites. We also have a team of scientists uh, that are participating to bring not just agronomic measurements but many of the in-depth measures um, focused on um, nitrogen cycling, carbon cycling um, with Kate Congreves and Melissa Arcand. Melissa Arcand is also going to be looking at microbial communities so we're going to be looking at um, soil enzymes and uh, PLFA or phospholipid, phospholipid fatty acids. And Kate Congreves is also uh, gonna be um, looking at some soil health tests. We're taking the Cornell soil health test and seeing how um, that test uh, performs in terms of evaluating soil health across our sites and within our treatments in, the, in this experiment. Um, Kate has a larger project looking at trying to calibrate the Cornell Soil Health Test uh, for prairie soils, which is very exciting. Then we're also going to be looking at um, nitrogen cycling and also nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, so with Mary Tenuta and Rich Farrell. I myself am going to be looking at physical properties of soil, um, 
carbon, both, you know, the fractions that we're, we're used to measuring, like soil organic matter, total carbon, but also some lighter fractions of carbon that are more microbially available. And I call that active carbon. You might also know it as um, some soil test labs are calling it pox C carbon. So potassium permanganate oxidizable carbon. So we can talk more about those. And I'm going to be looking at the overall economics of the rotation. So what is this rotation? What are some of the treatments that you're looking at here? So this experiment, I mean, you guys at Lethbridge uh, are so fortunate to have so many great long-term rotation studies um, with Ag Canada here. Um, this is a fairly small uh, a rotation study, but really um, we have two big treatments that we're comparing in a rotation. So a standard four-year rotation uh, on its own, standard practice, uh, compared to a, that same four-year rotation with cover crops added in every year. And then we're going to be comparing those two rotations to two other checks. One is you know, a, a short two-year rotation of wheat and canola, which is our best, you know, standard short season cash crop across the prairies that we can compare. And then I wanted a soil building best case scenario, right? What if you were going to put all your cards into improving soil quality? So we've got alfalfa or an alfalfa mixed with, uh, with a forage grass at all the sites as our, as our check. So at each site, all these four prairie sites, we've got a rotation tailored to, to that region. All four sites have canola and all four sites ha have wheat. And, and then we have another uh, pulse crop in the rotation at, here at Lethbridge, it's peas. Um, I have soybeans, for example, in Manitoba. And then we have another uh, grain crop in the rotation. So here in Lethbridge, it's Durham. Um, I'm growing oats in Manitoba. So, so the rotation varies across each of the provinces uh, or each of the sites, but those are, those are the trends. So here the rotation that we've got at Lethbridge, let me get this right, is wheat and canola, durum and peace. So when you walk through the plots, uh, the, the name that's highlighted in, in the big block letters is the, the crop that, that is here in this year. And all phases, so all of those crops are grown in each phase in each year. So we're going to have, you know, over the next four years, each crop growing each year with each combination of the cover crops. So let me tell you about how we paired up the different covers with these grain crops. So in the wheat, we're interseeding red clover. In the canola, we drill uh, lentils after harvest. Um, after the durum, we're seeding radish after harvest. And then after pea harvest, we drill uh, fall rye and winter pea. And fall rye is an important crop, uh, our cover crop that is tested at each of the sites. So we want to compare cover crops that are going to overwinter with cover crops that are going to winter kill. And so we're going to be able to compare those two types of cover crops in the rotations across all the prairies. That's right. So all of these, all of these cover crops are grown just for their biomass. Uh, the rye will be terminated before we plant the crop next year. Great question. So that's what we're looking at here. All the different phases, the four phases, we've got it replicated four times. Um, I've talked about some of the things that we're hoping to measure. We have, uh, you know, grain yield data and some cover crop data from uh, 2018 overall, as you can imagine, last year here in Lethbridge was super dry. There was very little cover crop. We were probably lucky just to get the plants established. That was my goal last year, even at my sites in Manitoba, because we had such a dry season. It was not a year where we have that moisture to support a lot of plant growth. Um, and so I think that's really important when planting cover crops, and that's what I'd like to you know, we can talk about if there are questions about what we're hoping to, to learn about in this study. Um, but in the here and now, what are some things that you can think about and take away if you are thinking about planting cover crops and where should we be planting cover crops? So, you know, um, Justin and I had several really good conversations about cover crops and he was explaining to me, you know, just how dry it's been here for the last three years, really and about some of the, uh, the places where it makes sense and doesn't make sense to be 
starting with cover crops um, here in the Lethbridge area. Um, Ken, am I going too fast? How am I doing for time? So the benefits, you're trying, to, you're trying to say the seed costs and everything is built into the benefits, right? Right, so I'm going to be doing an economic analysis um, from all of the four locations and we're going to be factoring in, you know, differences in yield, grain prices, and then the cost uh, to, for the seed and the time to establish the cover crop uh, in the analysis that we're going to do for this study. This is, yeah, so this is the second crop that we've planted in this study. And to be completely honest with you, uh, I think that uh, we are not really going to see different, big differences in this study, even by the end of the four-year period. You know, I think that these benefits are something that we're going to be accruing over time. So if we can keep this experiment going, uh, I think at the end of the four years, I'm calling that, you know, short to medium term. And we're going to be looking at how these benefits change over time. Is, is your cover crop always seeded after the harvest? In ah. other words, it's a fall shoulder season and early spring. That's a great question. So for this particular experiment with the, with the annual grain crops that we're growing in this particular experiment, because it's with the funders, with Western Grains, we're definitely focused on annual grain crops. We are, we are establishing most of our crops after harvest. But there are many strategies that look at interseeding and or other strategies that you can consider like seeding annual crops into perennial stands that you, you know, suppress with herbicides. So there are many different strategies that you could take, certainly with cover crops. In this particular study here, we're definitely focused on uh, drilling or broadcasting uh, towards the end of the season, the grain cropping season. And that would be zero till, right? Because conventional, as soon as you harvest it, bad word, but if you got in and uh, cultivated right away, you're going to get some volunteer, which is a lot cheaper than seed. Absolutely. You bring up a, a great point that, you know, it's kind of like weeds, right? What is our definition of a cover crop, you know, and we can use volunteers to foster, we can foster those volunteers and, and utilize them. You may want to supplement those volunteers with other crops, depending on the goals. We're going to talk about different types of, of cover crops in, in a minute. And, uh, and I think that is a, a really good strategy. You've got to pay attention there. If you have um, certain uh, insects or disease pests, like one that I can think of right away is wheat streak mosaic virus with winter wheat. So you've got to, you got to be, with cover crops in general, I, I say that it's, uh, you're, you're playing a hand, right? You've got, you're being dealt a hand and you've just got to think really carefully about that, that hand that you're playing uh, when you're coming up with a strategy for cover crops. See, we've been thinking of doing that too, but how do you do it? I mean, in that dry land out there, do you spread something and then just tear it like you said and pray for rain, like a rye maybe, and hope you get a cover crop out, say in your canola stuff. Mm -hmm. you get good, good seed to soil contact. Uh, soil contact. Yeah. You don't want to spend a ton of money if you haven't nope. made much that year. And especially when you're not sure, right? Like especially, yeah. we call this the I call this the cover crop hypothesis experiment because we're exploring, right? And so I think when you're starting. You want to start small, and you want to minimize your costs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I am a big proponent. Like you can go places and hear, um, uh, you can you can hear about you know uh, multi-species cover crop cocktail mixes, and you know if you're if you're advanced in your uh, practice of cover crops or implementing cover crops, I think you can get a great investment. If you're starting out, I think you should be looking to. Plants that you know, things that are recognizable, things that you can get seed easily for, because uh, uh, most of the mo it's mostly the management, the seeding while you're harvesting, the terminating when you're seeding. Uh, those are the things that make or break your success with cover crops as you're getting started. <laughs> Great, Ken. <laughs> And really, you know, those are useful plants. It's how you manage them, right? Your seed bank. 
So I wanted to invite Justin to join our conversation here and keep me honest as we talk about, you know, getting started with cover crops. One of the, uh, there's sort of four things that I really want to talk about. One is setting your goals. Uh, the second is finding your window. The third is, you know, selecting plants to match that goal and your window. And the fourth one, again, I'm a professor and a scientist, planning to evaluate. How are you going to know if it was success or not? Starting out, how, you know, we talked about the risks, right, and the costs. How are you going to know if it worked out? Or how are you going to decide whether that was worth doing it, even before you put the seed in the ground? Okay, so setting goals. So there is a wide range of goals that farmers have, right? We just walked through an experiment where we planted, uh, you know, five different crops on five different stubble types. Uh, Every farm has a different rotation, a different sequence, different equipment. You, you are the only person that can decide what your goal is. Um, I can talk about what some, what some other goals are, but only you uh, knows what's going to fit into that complex matrix that is your own cropping system. Certainly when I was talking with Justin about uh, this area, some of the goals we talked about were preventing wind erosion, but that's a really important one. Uh, keeping soil covered um, in this growing environment. Um, increasing soil organic matter is a common goal. That relates again to, to water management. Uh, flying into the Lethbridge area, I definitely saw areas of salinity. And so I think salinity management is another place. I mean, cover crops aren't going to cut it when you've got serious salinity. You need perennials. But in those areas around that saline slough, if, you, it was t if it was too wet for you to plant, what are you gonna do to get that ground covered? And that's where a cover crop, if you're not willing to commit to perennials, um, is, is I think an, an important strategy. Obviously in this area as well, you've got lots of livestock. So annual forages, and blending that into grazing systems. Um, some things that are on my mind that are Im important goals, redesigning cropping systems for the prairies are certainly things like pollinator habitat and habitat for beneficial insects. Um, and increasingly in Manitoba, farmers are um, concerned about soil compaction and things like cover crops. I can talk about that in more detail. When we look at these soils, managing soil compaction is also something that we can use cover crops uh, and plants in general, plant roots to address. Justin, mm -hmm. keep, me, keep me honest here. What are some of the most common goals that you have for your cover crops? Well, in general, at first I started cover cropping um, basically to increase our forage yields. I was double cropping a fall, a fall uh, cereal with a spring, spring cereal. And uh, so that was my initial goal and kind of it grew from there. So we have obviously saline areas around the property. So trying to get something growing in there, like if, if they're not fit for your cash crops rather than having nothing growing there. Um, I tried to put saline tolerant species in there and have them use up that water, keep, uh, keep the evapotranspiration from bringing more salts up. Um, I have also shifted to using cover crops for weed management, so having aggressive uh, crops like fall cereals work well to outcompete some of your weeds. Um, that has helped cut down on some tillage. So you don't necessarily have to do fall tillage if you have a fall cereal like fall rye in early enough it can help compete a lot of your winter annual weeds and keep the fields pretty clean um, basically trying to keep a mulch on the surface the more residue that i can keep there and uh, try and resist tilling that back in that improves infiltration rates for our irrigation and uh, also will save a lot of your your uh, moisture from evaporating when we do have hot dry weather um, so yeah those are probably kind of the general things I'm also building on that like Yvonne mentioned there trying to build habitat in areas that aren't farmable like little corners of fields and stuff that aren't that productive um, we can plant flowering species in there for beneficial insects and not disturb those so that habitat can persist for them and uh, yeah, kind of, there's, most of our land is manured, we have a feedlot, so in terms of nitrogen, that's not a big goal for me, but a lot of other producers, that is, they want to have legumes in there to fix the nitrogen. Uh, 
but you can also plant if you have the right sequence or interplant companion cover crop. Have a high nitrogen user with another um, nitrogen fixing cover crop, and, and there can be some synergies there as well. So it can get pretty complex. If you keep going. That's right. I mean, goals goals can be um, complementary. You might want to fix some nitrogen and provide cover. Um, but sometimes those goals are in opposition with each other. Like that same example. Often the species that are fixing nitrogen are legumes and they establish fairly slowly. I mean, unless you're working with something like peas. Um, but a lot of the clovers the, um, are slower to establish. And so you might need to come up with a mixture to meet those same goals. So let's, let's talk about uh, okay, I was transitioning to species selection, but I'm jumping over finding your windows. So once you have a goal in mind, then you take a look around at your rotation and say, okay, where is my best window for fitting these things in? And how does that mesh with when I have the labor and the equipment available um, to plant these things? So whether you're talking about taking your drill out again in the fall to plant the cover crop or broadcasting seed, which you would want to do when you have water. So if you're working on irrigated fields. Um, oh, here we go. I think from talking with Justin, it also sounds like, um, oh, oh, um, you know, where there is uh, silage or, or uh, silage crops, you've got a nice window there um, for growing something after silage harvest or combining cover crops as a strategy with manure application. And there's some really great work out of uh, Michigan uh, where they were actually looking at slurry seeding cover crops, adding the cover crop seed right in the manure with their applicator, which is something that could be really interesting to look at in, in this area. Um, Justin, what are some of your best windows for cover crops? Or um, what are the ones that challenge the you? Window would be fall seeding. Um, you know, usually we have enough <coughs> season at the end of harvest to get something established if it's a, obviously a, a, a winter cereal. Um, so rye, rye is pretty good because it it will grow pretty much any time, even if it's you seed it into dust. Eventually, you'll get enough moisture to get it to germinate. So that one's pretty easy. But you could use winter triticale or or winter wheat. Um, so that's probably when you'd have the most time. A lot of times, if you if you don't have irrigation, it's pretty tough because um, you basically would probably be committing a full season to a, a cover crop. Because after harvest, a lot of times you're not really going to have enough moisture to grow um, like a, a summer annual. But uh, with silage, if you got irrigation, that's another pretty good window. If it's uh, it's also a fall crop that's been harvested. You got all summer to get something else growing with water. So that works pretty well. Um, if you are gonna be on dry land and want to grow a cover crop, you should be seeding at the same time as your spring cash crops, because that's really the only time in a dry year that you have enough moisture to get it to germinate and get a, a reasonable stand of anything. So, so that's kind of the thing. If you want to have a good cover crop, you have to manage it the same as you would a cash crop. It needs a reasonable amount of fertility. It needs to be seeded properly and uh, basically use your common cash cropping sense when you seed them. Yeah. So if you don't put the effort in, you probably won't get a really good result with, with your stand there. So. And that's where I really encourage people to start small, right? And be really strategic in balancing your goals with you know what's doable um, for a plan a scenario and then a plan b scenario both for planting and and termination i mean we could talk a lot about different uh, establishment and termination methods um, but that i think that's more than we've got time for today um, if we could talk about you know marrying those um, those ideas of what are my goals what are my windows with you know, what kind of cover crop suits those goals and that window. And um, so there are, are many different types of plants that we've got out there. Some of them we grow all the time. Um, 
you know, we grow, uh, we grow cool season, uh, cool season grasses all the time on the prairies and they can be great cover crops. We also grow, you know, some cool season legumes like peas that are my personal favorite. They're more expensive because they've got a large seed size. We've spent a lot of time breeding for large seeded peas. Um, there's also some that we or I grow less often and those are warm season legumes. Those are things that I look to when I'm trying to establish uh, cover crops when it's hot and dry. And there's also um, warm season forage, uh, annual forages like sorghum, pearl millet, sorghum sedan grass. You can grow a lot of biomass and they establish well when it's hot and dry as well. So really challenging ourselves to take a look at the range of plants that we have and, and trying to uh, match them with, uh, with the conditions and with our goals. Um, the, some of the goals that I brought up earlier, providing ground cover. I certainly think that winter cereals are our best go-to cover crops. Uh, whether you're growing them for grain or growing them uh, for just for their biomass and keeping things covered. And we have many different ones to choose from. We've got rye, we've got winter wheat, we've got uh, even triticale. Um, so having something that's going to grow through that winter period and, and Justin has been telling me about how open the winters can be here and unpredictable they can be in terms of when you might get heat and moisture uh, to grow those cover crops that that may be your best time to feed those microorganisms in the soil and to grow those extra roots that are going to help build and aggregate soil is using using your winters. Um, how big does that rye get in spring when you terminate it? Huh. Depends how long you leave it. Yeah. Uh, That's what I'm, you know, rough it. Well, it depends on when you're seeding. So if you want to seed earlier on, right, it might only be a foot tall or six yeah. inches tall. Like this year, it was probably two weeks behind, it seemed like, um, other years. But uh, if you're seeding towards the end of your seeding window, it might be, you know, four feet tall. Yeah. So and you then you terminate it just at seeding or? after seeding or what? It depends. Like the easiest way to terminate if you if you spray it out, right? Then yeah, you that's can, what I mean. You can do that depending on how sensitive the crop you're seeding into it is. Like a rye can be allelopathic, so if you have a small seeded crop like canola or something like that, can be sensitive mm -hmm. yeah. to that allelopathy. So you may want to give it more time to senesce after it's been sprayed before you seed into it, but that is not. Because you read about them in the U.S., they see mm -hmm. them to write like this tall and then they terminate it after. Call green seeding. I have, a, I have an experiment looking at green seeding right now in Manitoba. So we're comparing spraying out rye two weeks before planting, terminating it just days before planting, which according to the green seeders uh, is often one of our worst termination times compared to terminating the rye at or after planting. Um, which I think is one of the best uh, windows as long as you're not concerned about water use. Uh, and then we'll be looking also at late termination of rye. So rye, you know, timing around your first herbicide application. Um, so, so there's definitely a lot to learn about green seeding on the prairies. But I think from those that have been doing it in places like North Dakota, terminating two weeks before harvest or right at or sorry, harvest planting, <laughs> or right at or after planting. And I think a lot of the, the interest in um, leaving rye grow until you plant also relates to your equipment and seed to soil contact. So if you can have that rye standing up, even though it's tall and huge, it's easier for your drill to get through that rye compared to when it's terminated or worked in and then is residue that is a challenge for your planter. So it, it's really driven by your equipment too. Um, it, for saline areas, um, I've seen a lot of demonstrations. Um, these are pictures from a demonstration that, that I planted in North Dakota a long time ago when I was there. And certainly some of the crops that do well in saline areas are things you might know well here. So things like barley and sugar beets, they have done really well in, uh, in saline areas. Camelina is another crop. That maybe you've heard of it grew really well and as well sorghum sedan grass was something that did that I've seen do really well not in white areas but along the edges of where it's white right 
Um, and then for pollinators, um, I've done a little bit of work looking at different cover crops for pollinators. Um, my number one favorite that's not even on this list here is Phacelia, but there are also things like buckwheat, camelina again, that provide early season, oh wait, Phacelia is here, that provide early season flowers um, to really help those pollinators. Uh, okay, so we've talked about species and how they need to match your goals and your windows. Um, anything else we want to say about species? What are your go-to species? Uh, I probably use the most fall rye, like it, it seems to check the most boxes because it's really resilient, it can grow anytime. It's kind of salt tolerant, it'll grow in the saline areas, get lots of biomass, roots really well, competitive with weeds. Um, so we use quite a bit of that. So that would be the basis for a lot of acres. Um, if you want other saline species, you know, we'll put barley in there. Um, sweet clover works pretty well in saline areas. Ideally, if you can get alfalfa in and like perennial crops in, in the hardest, hardest to farm areas, whether they're dry or salty or whatever, those work pretty good. So we use for a bit of alfalfa. And uh, for flowering, like probably I, I prefer Facelia as well. It's pretty easy to establish. It, the bees really love it. So that would be probably my top one. Um, I really love it. Um, what rate would you see the rye just? Depends on, you know, if it's... In but it's all, and it's all irrigation, right? Generally, yeah. Yeah, yeah rye's pretty tough on dry land uh, if you don't terminate and we don't get any rain. I've done that before and got no crops. So. But uh, if you want a lighter stand that you want to seed into, probably go like a bushel an acre type of thing. If you want lots of biomass, probably go two bushels an acre. If it's a tough area that um, it's not really going to get a good stand, then I'd even go higher to probably three bushels an acre type of thing. Other questions for Justin or me about species? So the last thing I wanted you to take away is, you know, how are we going to evaluate success? You have your goal, you have your plan, did it work out or not? And so planning ahead of time, how am I going to know if I, if this was a good investment or not? And that could be, you know, looking at your stand establishment, looking at how much ground cover you have, especially if your goal is to provide ground cover. So you can get um, a phone app to, you know, scan your field and say, do I have 50% ground cover, 30% ground cover? It's called the Canopio app. It's a free app. You can download it on your phone. You can visually look at it. That's also low tech. Um, there are other measures that we can do. You know, maybe your concern, you're doing it to benefit the crop afterwards. So you can look at, you know, your plant stands. Did my, did my cover crop, um, you know, uh, provide a soil bed, soil seed bed? that's favorable for crop establishment and growth. Maybe for you, yield is everything. I think for everyone it is, right? So leave yourself a check strip so you can compare with and without your cover crop, how you're doing. Um, maybe you're doing this for the soil, right? So what are some easy, low-tech soil measures that you can use um, for evaluating whether cover crops are, are building better soils or not over time? Um, you can do a jar test, so take out a jar of water and fill that jar and put, take an aggregate of soil and put it in and see how long it stays together. The trick with all of your soil evaluation is going to be, what do I compare it to, right? So you need to have something in mind that you're gonna compare it to, a certain field that's either your best field, the field that you think is, is doing the best, or something that is uh, what you started with. Um, for me, when I am evaluating how, how my crops are doing and how cover crops are doing, I just t take my shovel, right? And I go out and I dig and I look for things that match my goals. Um, so some of the things that we can talk about uh, with cover crops and some of the goals that we have might relate to how well aggregated soil is. Um, and, you, and this soil here shows some great aggregation as well as some real uh, platy structure and some root restricting layers. So you can see here, I don't know if you can see any of it, we can pass it around. Here we've got, this was sort of probably an old tillage 
depth line so we have some real uh, a real plate there. This soil that I'm handing around, we have a cameo appearance from this earthworm, which may yeah. be another great measure. You can see these aggregates, right? Oh yeah, they're one of the best things in the yeah. world. Yeah, and so they're chewing, another there's one. a little guy here, right? They're, they're leaving you these big holes, those big macropores that are really important for water movement. Yeah. And What would the moisture content be here? I have no idea <laughs> of that so but I would still call this wet and friable right it breaks apart into peds easily the other thing that you want to look for is where are my roots um, because roots are important both for the crop that's growing but also the channels that they create afterwards so you know we talked about those earthworm channels being important for water movement earthworm channels as well as root channels from old or channels that old roots leave in your soil are also really important for water movement and for other roots so where you know in manitoba especially where we're dealing more with soil compaction the more plant roots that you have growing that you leave in place to die decompose to create those large channels for other roots to follow um, uh, through root restricting layers are really important and the only time that plant roots can grow through those root restricting layers are when the soil is moist which tends to not be when we're growing our our main annual grain crops right so that that winter period that you have here in Lethbridge I think would be a great time to have cover to let those roots uh, for those cover crops or those winter cereals push through those root restricting layers and then leave that network in place and you're going to find places i've got an example here where you've got channels uh here we've got this this old wheat stem right and you can just barely see it's kind of wrecked now this channel here that follows where that crown is is dying back i'm tempted to not break it here but you can see how there are these channels that persist and so you you know just like with soil structure you you accumulate that, that structure over time part of that structure is those root channels and they're really valuable both for these plants that are going to grow roots through them but also as surfaces for soil microorganisms so if you think about where microorganisms live in the soil it's not it's not in the middle of this clot right it is on all of these platy and, ag and angular surfaces along those aggregates and those root channels those are buffets right because whatever was in that plant root was exudated out through its roots and then the root itself decomposes and those are you know places where you have more microbial activity just because there's more there um, for them to eat and then you know uh, there's company right so you you have the, the organisms that are there to decompose the roots and then you pull in the organisms that are there to eat the organisms that were decomposing those roots and so you you build communities um, and build structure in soil uh, through through those things those mechanisms okay so uh, I was talking with someone from down to earth lab here and uh, and he was saying you know that standard organic matter levels here are around three per three percent for brown soils and then higher on your on your black soils um, I don't think that any of our treatments here have affected soil organic matter levels in one year I'm not even sure if we will see a change in four years but as I was talking about, um, there are these other fractions of carbon that we can test for. So I talked about this active carbon and those are the types of carbon that come from plant roots and organic matter that are more readily decomposable or being eaten by soil microbes. And so I hope that maybe in four years we'll be starting to see those types of changes in this soil with annual cover crops. Ooh, so much to talk about, but it's great to start the conversation. Um, and, you know, I am around for the rest of the day. If anyone wants to talk with me or Justin, I think, is here for lunch. And, uh, and I'd love to talk with you and, and we can talk about your questions.
uh, Ben, thanks for your time and uh, looking forward to seeing what happens here in this experiment uh, at Farming Smarter.